would say to anybody, whatever period of time you're watching television for, for, for three days do an experiment, plug out of the collective and watch some videos on comedy and laugh. Laugh, suck in the oxygen, strengthen your immune system and um, increase all those, in, all those endorphins are so healing for the body. People have actually cured themselves of cancer by watching comedy sleep by laughing and saturating the body with positive chemicals. Now do that for three days. I challenge anyone to do that, and it'll change your perspective on reality completely. Welcome to the 1000 Days Sober podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I'm not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I'm someone that doesn't drink alcohol. And I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same. Now you might have noticed a slight change there in my intro. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, after about seven or eight years of running this podcast, yes, it's been that long, I'm changing the name. It's not the Alcohol Addiction Podcast anymore. It is the 1000 Days Sober Podcast. It's bringing it in line uh, with our brand, with our philosophy, with um, our educational platforms. Uh, we are 1000 Days Sober. And as I've gravitated more and learned more and, and developed my interest in this thing, um, I've had less people on talking about, you know, smoking issues, drug issues, that kind of thing. So in the beginning, the Alcohol Addiction Podcast, it suited it, but not anymore. We're going to be called 1000 Days Sober Podcast. So um, please spread the word if you like the podcast and uh, you think I provide some value Send it out there to people and tell people about it and give me some feedback as well. One of the one of the things about the differences between a podcast and a community forum like Strive is you don't get any feedback. Nobody really tells you if you if what you're talking about is affecting their life or how you would like to, me to change what I'm doing to provide even more value for you. So please uh, reach out to me at the truth about alcohol at gmod.com and let me know how this podcast has impacted you over the last seven, eight years. Okay. Now we are, as you know, currently in this uh, state of lockdown. It's going to get a little bit weird for everybody as the economy opens up uh, quicker than our uh, safety concerns are being allayed. Uh, so if that is being happening to you, then please check out the two previous podcasts I did with Lisa Dinhofer, the Crisis Tamer, 1000 Days Sober Coach, where we actually talked about the collective grief and trauma process of dealing with a pandemic of this nature. But also, how do we deal with it? Now we're moving um, into this unknown. You know, Lisa was a survivor of the 1993 World Trade uh, Center bombing in New York, right? So she talks about how, you know, people had to go back to work and they couldn't even get into the elevator, right, to, to go up to work because it was so petrified. It's going to be the same for people, you know, not necessarily leaving their homes because we're doing that to go grocery shopping and so forth. But going back to work, getting on a train, getting on a plane, getting on a bus, yeah, it's going to gonna be really, really um, overwhelming and uncomfortable for us. So please listen to those podcasts, both of them by Lisa Dinoffer. Um, listen to them. You will really enjoy them. And also go to www.1000daysober.com. You'll find one of our pages. It's called the 1000 Days Sober Podcast. And when you go on there, you'll see an individual page for individual episodes. If you click on those pages, and sign up your email address, you will receive a copy of extensive show notes, a full transcript of the show, and an amazing workbook. An amazing workbook dedicated to that particular episode, which will ask you some really, really great uh, introspective, uh, deep questions that you could answer that will really help cement the knowledge and understanding that you've gained through that podcast experience. Same with this podcast today. Um, the same thing will be there. Listening to a podcast, you shouldn't just be listening to a podcast and that's the end of it. You really should be listening to a podcast and taking notes, either mentally or physically. I prefer physically. And then taking some action on those notes. So at least, and that action could just be talking about it as someone. It could be asking yourself some questions. But please, it's really important that you start to learn um, from the education that we're providing you, not just let it be noise, 
okay? And it's very easy in this day and age to have so much noise in our head because there's so much options for podcasts. So use those workbooks. They're exceptional. And if you would like us to put something in there that is not in there, then reach out, let us know, okay? Rate us, review us, join us on Instagram, get over to YouTube, all 1,000 Days Sober, and uh, yeah, and join our, join our email list on the website as well because we're always sending emails out on blog posts and that kind of stuff, all right? Now, on to our next guest. So our next guest is a Strive coach. His name is Vincent Grant. I'm going to read what Vinny says about himself on the 1000 Days Sober bio. Over the last decade, says Vinny, I've developed and evolved my craft, including discovering through contemplation new methodologies that I use with people to create very deep and profound change. I work spontaneously and I'm continually learning new ways of releasing traumatic feelings that are inspired by the client's change process. Much of my work involves working with the language of the subconscious and superconscious mind. I use a symbolic representation of the emotion associated to the traumatic memory and guide the higher aspects of the client to take the client through an inner journey of the landscape of their mind as a symbolic representation, the emotion to change and release. My favorite process involves working directly with the light that flows from within the client, connecting them to it consciously and guiding it to remove the trauma emotions. It's proven to be an incredible, effective part of my work. Vinny is, like I said, a 1,000 Days Sober coach. What does that mean? That means if you join Strive, and Strive is £40 a month, you get to work with Vinny uh, on a one-to-one -one basis for free. Yeah, you don't have to pay anything. And Vinny is just one of four coaches. We have Vinny, we have Lisa, we have Liza, we have John, all covering grief, trauma, health, wellness, nutrition, uh Anything you think of, we're going to have it covered in the future or we're covering most of it now, okay? So you get that for £40 a month subscription. But get over to www.1000daysober.com. We're giving you a free month of Strive, right? We're giving you a free month of Strive. So you can get on Strive for a month, see if you like it. If you don't like it, don't worry, you can leave. And uh, if you do like it, you can hang around, all right? Our next 1,000 Days Sober experience, our educational process to help you go 1,000 Days Sober, starts in July. So it's a perfect time to join Strive now so you can start to get ready and amped up, ready for that journey, all right? Now, why did I get Vinny on? Well, I got Vinny on because, you know, again, with this COVID thing, we there's a lot of people out there right now who are getting utterly and utterly overwhelmed with the fear of dying, of illness, of losing their job, um, everything that you can think of in terms of emotions are probably accentuated 1,000x since we've been in lockdown, okay? And that is leading to a lot of people to drink alcohol. And what I wanted to get Vinny on to discuss was my belief that we can be interested in what is we could be aware of what is going on in the world. So I'm aware that if I step out the door and I don't wear, wear a mask, I'm likely to catch COVID and I could bring it back and kill my family. But I don't have to be interested in it. I don't have to sit in front of the news every day and have my mind polluted by the negative energy and to actually catch the contagion of fear uh, that is sweeping, what is a pandemic which is sweeping the world right now. So... I just want people to kind of like start to think about whether or not they can divorce themselves away from the noise um, whilst at the same time uh, being, you know, being very intelligent emotionally and IQ wise to develop skills and strategies and risk assessments to protect your family. Um, I think that there is no need for this to turn into a mass panic that leads you to uh, buy the entire stock of the Tesco's alcohol aisle. I really don't. So me and Vinny are going to talk about that. Vinny's going to talk a little about work about Byron Katie. My inspirations come from Dr. Michael Beckwith. So without further ado, I'm going to shut the hell up and leave you in the capable hands of Vincent Grant, 1,000 Days Sober Coach and Trauma Expert. And also, don't forget, get over to www1000 Days Sober to get your workbook on this exercise and learn more about Vinnie Grant, okay? Take care yourselves, folk. Goodbye. Welcome, 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 1,000 Days Sober Coach, Vincent Grant. How's life, Vinnie? Good, thank you. 
it's beautiful here in Turkey, really sunny and this blue sky, white fluffy clouds, perfect. I remember going to Torquay once and um, <laughs> getting <laughs> getting very, very drunk. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the, it was a football tour. And I remember I went out all day, you know, as you do, like you go to the pub at like 11 o'clock in the morning and you drink all day. And this was, this was whenever, when I was a drinker, I was a lush, right? I really liked to drink. But I also didn't like to drink. Do you mm-hmm. get me? Not like now. It was different back then. It was, <clears throat> I never had this view that I could ever not drink. It was inconceivable to me that I'd never be able to stop drinking. I didn't even think about it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but when I was on a tour, like a, a football tour or something, I really struggled. I wasn't one of those who could just bang it down me for three days straight. And, oh. and I used to disappear. So we were there on... Um, the Friday, it was like our first day there. We'd actually traveled up very early, so we'd started drinking like 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And um, by the time the afternoon rolled around, I was so drunk and sick of drinking, I sneaked off to a casino on my own. I did me bollocks in the casino, um, and then I come back to the hotel, and the, the entire football team were outside the hotel with their bags. The, the hotel had kicked us out mm-hmm. for, for being um, drunk, and we all had to find new digs. We ended we ended up we ended up somewhere else, somewhere outside of Tokyo. I can't remember where it was, but mm-hmm. it well, was, was gone. Paynton or Newton Abbott? Paynton. Yeah, I, I actually remember um, people often talk about the value that you know, we always say that uh, at 1000 Days Sober that there's no value in drinking alcohol. And obviously, if you're an addict, you deny that and you, you believe wholeheartedly that alcohol provides you value. And one of the values that people believe it provides is it lowers their inhibition and that that is a good thing. Well, when I was in Torquay, I took all my clothes off, ran into the middle of a lawn bowls competition in Saturday afternoon and did a downward facing dog. So um, oh. that, that is an example of inhibitions not being good, Vinny. Yes, yeah, I agree, Lee. I agree. But the thing is, back then, you know, like you talk and tell mm-hmm. these stories and even now they're, they're, they, they sound funny, but they're not, are they? It's the, it's the culture that we're raised in that says, oh, when someone tells a, a drunken a, a drunken story, that it's, it's going to be a funny story. It's funny, but it's it's not funny, is it, to take your clothes off on a Saturday afternoon and do a downward dog in the middle of a blown balls? Not in the moment, no, not in the moment. Because when we when when I imagine that, I didn't focus on the response of the people that were present yeah. and the shock and horror on their face. I saw a very small snippet a very shortened version, which was not reflective of the whole experience. So and, I I agree can, with you. and I can tell you, it was a very shortened uh, <laughs> version as well. You know, it's true what they say about the Chinese and their peckers, you know. Uh, anyway, enough about my manhood. <clears throat> the reason I got you on here, Vinny, was me and you were doing some work yesterday. You was helping healing me and around my... Anger issues, low self-esteem issues, you know, lots of different ingredients going into this cauldron of uh, the personality that is Lee Davy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the things that we we stumbled across is this concept that I'd learned from Michael Beckwith that you would learn from Byron Katie. And it's one that I struggle to explain to people. So I, w- I wanted to have a conversation with you about it because I think it's really important, particularly in today's times, and people will um, learn from it or at very least be able to ask us some questions. So I'll explain the Michael Beckwith thing first and then you can chime in with the, the Byron Katie and our conversation ensue from there. Um, so I used to go to Agape Spiritual Church in uh, Los Angeles and um, it is run by uh, Dr. Michael Beckwith. If anyone's not aware of that name, but they've watched The Secret, he's the guy with the dreadlocks. 
you know, and that, that's why I first went to Agape because I, the secret had a big effect on me when I watched it. And he, he was a very inspirational uh, part of that. And Michael Beckwith, what, you know, when I went one week, he had this sermon and he was talking about the world being in a bad place. This is long before the pandemic. The world being in a bad place, school shootings being so common, they don't even make the news, the news headlines anymore. Um, economic disaster, our politicians being prats, like lo- lots of things going wrong in the world. And he was saying to his audience that it is so easy in today's modern techno- te- technological arena for us to allow all that information to permeate our soul almost and to drive us into despair. And what he said was, it's really important to be aware of what going is going on in the world, but we don't have to be interested in it. So he was talking about awareness. So today, for example, I need to be aware that there's a pandemic out there um, and the safety precautions I need to take to protect my family. And I need to know what's going on in the state of California and in the UK but I don't have to be interested in it. And what I mean by that is I don't have to sit in front of CNN every day and read blog posts every day of death and disaster and allow that to drag my energy down, you know? Um, So that is really important to me because a lot of people, when they drink alcohol and they they get embroiled in um, alcoholism as an invisible, violent, dominant belief system, they feel overwhelmed by life and it leads them to drink. And, I'm, and, I, and I try to coach them and guide them that, okay, we don't have to be overwhelmed over these things. We can just know that they exist, but we don't. We can detach ourselves away from the, the event because it's not actually affecting us right now in this moment, okay? So that, that's me on awareness and um, interest. We were talking yesterday about that and you talked about Byron Katie's three uh, principles around a similar vein. Talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, First of all, and this is related, I'd like to rewind back to when you said uh, um, that I healed you. And and I appreciate you saying that, but I just want to clarify that actually I don't. What I do is enable a person to heal themselves by letting go of stuff, emotional stuff, and equally importantly, the shift in their mindset. Now, when there's a shift in their mindset, they think differently and they feel differently. So what's taking place in their mind is different to what taking place. So what takes place in their body as an emotion becomes different as well. So if I just move forward a little bit to Byron Katie, this principle that there are three types of business, my business, for example, um, everybody else's business and the creator, the divine God, whatever you want to call it, what we can't explain. It's another another type of business. That's the divine's business. Mm -hmm. When I keep my attention on my business, I can remain in peace. When I want to make other people change or be different or put my attention on them and what they've done and make a judgment, I have moved my attention from me onto them and completely altered my mindset. I enter into an internal dialogue in my head, which is critical, judgmental, and I focus on that and then revisit that over and over in different ways. An example being the coronavirus. I, that is not my business. I follow the protocols, but it's not my business. When I look out the window, I do not see the coronavirus. When I'm driving down the road, I do not see the coronavirus. What I see is a beautiful day. I see beautiful nature around me. I see people, some wear masks, some don't wear masks. Some wear gas masks. All their mindsets are different, and they're having different experiences in their head and body. And that's why some wear a gas mask, some wear a mask, and some don't. So it's not fixed. Everybody's creating a different experience for themselves. Coronavirus, irrelevant to me. Irrelevant. I follow the protocols to respect other people. I follow those, but it's irrelevant to me. 
I have plugged out of the collective consciousness around the coronavirus, which is fear, it's putrid and it's rotten. And it's, it's never ending. And it will suck the life and joy out of anybody that is exposing themselves to it. As they expose themselves to it, that information is going in and then they are creating narratives and stories in their own mind. And that is reinforcing the fear-based thinking that the body responds appropriately in those negative emotions. The physical body is flooded with cortisol and stress hormones, weakening the immune system, um, driving people to have quick fixes like junk food, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, um, toxic, more toxic information that creates that kick of adrenaline. And it's a downward spiral. But if I go to the center of the storm, it's because, and if I was exposing myself to that, the center of the storm is that I'm putting my business outside of me onto something and making it so real, even though I cannot see it, that it is consumed my very being. That doesn't make sense to me in the slightest. Um, Everybody on the planet are having a unique experience of reality. That tells me I have choice. I'm a sovereign being and I can be conscious and have a choice of what I experience. And I refuse to indulge in the negativity, the putrid rotten of the media. Now, I can still be responsible by following the protocols, which I do. So going back to Byron Katie. I keep my business on me. I can then maintain my peace and equilibrium and my joy and get on with my life. If I put it on the coronavirus, I've taken my attention off me and I put it on the coronavirus and the media and all of that stuff and fear. And I plugged into the collective consciousness around this issue, which is fear based and dark. Mm. Um, I can then take it a stage further and I can criticize the divine. How do you create this? People are dying from it. What's wrong with you? This is wrong. This is bad. So what am I doing in that moment? I'm resisting what is real and true. I've taken my attention off me and I'm telling the big fella or the big woman what to do and how it should be. Mm. And that is negative for me as an experience. However, and also it doesn't achieve anything. It doesn't achieve anything. I'm just contributing to the pool of negativity around this issue. I would rather contribute um, being a conscious sovereign being that is choosing to be calm, at peace, and joyful. That's what I want to bring into reality for other people to experience. I want to be an example of what I would choose to be if I was a conscious sovereign being, which, which I am. I refuse to hand my power over to this invisible thing that we call a virus. I understand it's impacting on people's lives and it's taken lives, but so has cancer. Now, if we want to worry about something, we want to worry about cancer. If, you, if somebody wants to create fear for themselves and concern, one in three people have died of cancer. But why are we not all panicking about cancer when one in three people die of it? So this is, you know, people have been pulled into a collective and they're in fear and they have lost any contact with their true self. And they are responding to their own fear responses in the body, which is because they have taken their attention off themselves and put it on this collective consciousness mm. around the coronavirus. I have, um, I have a view on cancer I'd like to share with you, interested on your thoughts on what I have to say. So... I believe, as you know, that we are born we are born and raised to drink alcohol. It is it's it's part of a the human nature, the human condition is the way as drinking water, eating food, keeping fit, like having a roof over you. Like it drinking alcohol in Western culture, particularly for young young boys. It's almost like a rite of passage into adulthood, right? It's, it's so normalized and so ubiquitous and you see it everywhere 
that because of that, the fact that it kills 3.3 million people a year, and we're nowhere near that right now with coronavirus, obviously. So alcoholism kills 3.3 million people a year. The reason we don't see that and get so freaked out about that is because of this invisible, violent, and dominant belief system that doesn't have a name and we don't even see that it exists. We just believe that alcohol is normal because of this belief system. And it's not until someone like me comes along and names it and says, no, it's called alcoholism. We can start talking about how it, the system works, that, that we see it for what it is. And that helps people on 1,000 days sober stop drinking. Now, the reason that alcoholism as an invisible, violent, and dominant belief system exists, and it's not the only invisible, violent, and dominant belief system. Eating meat is another one. And you know the damage that, that that does to animals and the fact that we, we um, cognitively switch off from that it's because of this belief system as well. Uh, the, the reason alcoholism exists is we're part of an addictive system called life. Life is an addictive system. Life breeds addicts. It teaches us that behaving in the way of an addict is the right way and the best way to get on. And part of that thinking when how it relates to cancer is is addicts have a real skewed concept of time it's almost as if we believe that we are immortal and that we're going to live forever and, and i think a part of that is the need at a young age to push the cognitive dissonance out of the way that we're going to die like we, we cannot be thinking that we're going to die all the time. So we, we develop this thinking that, well, we're never going to die. <laughs> all right, me and you know we're going to die, but we don't think that we're going to die because we don't think about it, right? So cancer is a, very, is a long-term thing for a lot of people unless they go to the doctors and he tells you, you've got the big C, you ain't got long left, and we're going to have to do chemotherapy. That, my friend, is very different to the specter of cancer when you're smoking and you're drinking, you know, you worry about it, but you're not really worrying about it enough because the pain's not as present mm -hmm. and it's acute mm -hmm. as the pain of stopping because it's more long-term thinking. The addictive, the addictive mind doesn't think long-term. It just thinks yeah. of a hit. Now with coronavirus, where that's different to cancer is it's right in your fucking face. It's there in your face. There's a there's a death counter on the news channels of CNN. I don't know what it's like in in the UK, but, but in in the in, in here on CNN, which my father-in-law watches all the time, there's a death counter. It shows you how many people are dying, and it ticks up. So so when that's right in your face, and you think that you could die tomorrow, now it breeds. Now it the addicts love that, and now it breeds this. Um, this negativity, this fear, this um, everything that's going on about it. But then, and here's the other thing, and then I'll shut up. What happens is you lock yourself in your house for two months. You drink alcohol like it's nobody's business because you're so overwhelmed and you so are interested in God's business and you, you think you're going to die and all that kind of stuff. But then after two months, guess what happens, Vinny? You don't die. And, and, and nobody around you dies or catches it. Okay. So then all of a sudden you start to think to yourself, actually, um, this isn't so bad as I thought it would be. So now you switch from thinking about COVID being right in your face to thinking that COVID's like cancer and you're never going to catch it. And guess what's going to guess what's going to happen, Vinny? Everybody's going to go out into the street. Yes. They're not going to wear their masks. They're going to fucking dance and party and go to pubs. I, I, I heard yesterday that Wisconsin had opened their bars. And yeah. coronavirus uh, casualties just went through the roof. Um, and, and it's this addictive thinking. What do you think on that? Um, yeah, I, um, I agree with you that I think the most significant thing that stands out from that, or one of them, is the fact that whatever's being shown to us as an issue becomes an issue if we allow ourselves to be absorbed into it. So coronavirus, we're only having this response to it because of the way it's been rolled out to us. Consider flu. Now, I, I've asked so many people, how many people do you know with coronavirus? Most say nobody, and some say one or two. And then and I ask them, how many people have died of that that you know? Nobody at all. I know two people that have had coronavirus and fully recovered. 
when I think about the flu leap during the flu season, and I ask myself, how many people do I know with flu, or if I did, it would be significantly more than two, I can tell you that. And, and I can guarantee if I ask people um, during the flu season, how many people do you know with flu, I can guarantee it would be significantly more than none, or one, or two. And flu kills people every year. Thousands and thousands of people die every year of flu. But we all go to work, we interact with our families, we go down the pub. There's no issue at all. I believe it's, again, the way it's been rolled out to us, continually feeding us with fear images, images and narratives. And people are, have made it their business to such a degree that they are continually thinking about it, talking about it, and in fear of catching it. And I, and I think, um, and that is only because of the way it's been portrayed and delivered to us. If alcohol was portrayed in the same way, and there was accounts, as you say, with the amount of deaths, and it was on the news every day, and we saw people suffering in hospital, and we saw them in a ventilator because the lungs are packing up, you know, we'd have a very different attitude towards alcohol. So we are, in effect, being controlled and manipulated. Now, I'm not saying whether that's for a positive agenda or a negative agenda, whatever it is, I don't. You know, I've got my views, but I'm not going to say, say what the, those are. But we are re reacting. And if we are reacting, we are being manipulated and controlled, whether we like it or not. And I know that, Lee, because I was one of those that was watching the news every day. And I never even watched television. And I had fear inside of me. And I remember Boris Johnson saying something like, you could lose a member of your family. But the way he phrased it was like, you're all going to lose somebody close, which, which isn't. We've come down the other side, away from the peak, and that is not the case. And I, for a period of time, probably about a week and a half, was locked into it. And it was only when I unplugged myself from that consistent flow of information that I found my peace again. And I would say to anybody, whatever period of time you're watching television for, for, for three days, do an experiment, plug out of the collective and watch some videos on comedy and laugh, laugh, suck in the oxygen, strengthen your immune system and um, increase all those, in, all those endorphins are so healing for the body. People have actually cured themselves of cancer by watching comedies, Lee, by laughing and saturating the body with positive chemicals. Now do that for three days. I, I challenge anybody to do that. And it will change your perspective on reality completely. Mm. You'll feel more healthier. They'll feel more, more positive, focused, able to get on with things. That fear will go completely. And Lee, they'll be able to think for themselves. Because at the moment, people aren't thinking for themselves. If they're in fear, they're not, they're responding. They're not thinking for themselves, Lee. Mm. Yeah, they're we... not thinking for themselves. I mean, the one thing that came up for me with all of this is uh, the element of control. You know, you, you certainly, when, when I'm stuck in LA and I can't get back to the UK to see my son, I realize there's a little bit of the Berlin Wall about it. You know, like when people in the East just went to visit relatives in the West and overnight a wall went up and they couldn't ever get back. Yeah, and yeah. Um, although I'm thinking to myself, like, it's all about our mental maps. So although we read about the Berlin Wall and we read about all the things that happened before our time, it doesn't really fit into our mental map. So there's a part of me thinking, well, of course I'll be able to get on a plane and go see my boy soon. But who knows? It could never, ever happen again. You just never know, right, because you don't have a mental map for it. But I'm not going to freak out about the perception to, or the, the assumption that that could happen. I'm just going to hold on to the hope that I will see my son again and that things will get back to normal and then just focus on my own business. I mean, Who mindsets hmm. on the flu, on the flu side of, uh, on the flu side of things. Um, I just want to make it clear that, um, I mean, you can tell me uh, if I'm wrong here cause I'm talking for you in a way. I want to make it clear to people listening cause I know this is a really contentious issue. I don't think Vinny's talking about, I don't think Vinny's saying, Hey, the death rates in flu are higher than 
coronavirus. So what's going on? We're talking about the belief systems that drive these behaviors. So for example, um, I, if you compare flu to COVID, I think it's very similar to alcohol and heroin. Uh-huh. So, so although, although we know people who have the flu and we've experienced the flu, and if you're listening to this and you're not um, in your 70s or your 80s or your 60s with respiratory problems and you've really nearly died, you know, with the flu, and you're more like, you know, my and Vinny's dap who probably had it when he was in your 20s or 30s and, fought it and spent a couple of days in bed and got out the other side. The belief system around flu almost universally will be, oh, I've caught the flu or I'm going to catch a flu. It's not nice, but it's not the end of the world, right? Same with alcohol. It's like, yeah, alcohol gives us an hangover or whatever and screws us up a little bit, but it's not like heroin. Heroin could kill you. I, I remember when I was younger and I saw this... Can I just say something, Lee? Mm. Flu kill people. No, no, no. What I'm saying is I know it kills people and I know it's killed more people and it will kill more people in 2020 than coronavirus will. That's not my point. My point is unless there is a massive media push to scare the – even if there is a massive media push to scare the life out of you on flu, it won't matter. Even if there's a mass media push – to showcase the number of deaths with alcohol, it won't matter. People will keep drinking in the same way that people shortly will start leaving their houses and putting their family at risk because the specter of immediate death that comes with um, watching uh, a a TV show when you're younger and seeing a heroin addict uh, shoot up and die or Mm. watching someone sniffing an aerosol can and dying or taking ecstasy, going to rave, dancing all night, not drinking too much water and dying. Mm-hmm. What, what, you don't see that in alcohol. You don't no. see that in flu. You no. don't even see it in smoking. Who lights a cigarette up, takes a puff and dies? Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yes, it's, yes. So, so, I agree. So the addict, the addict brain is all about Shake the shit out of me now, and I'll do something about it. Mm -hmm. Leave me now, and I'll do something about it. Threaten to leave me if I don't change in the future. I'm not going to change because I know you're not going to leave me. Yes, yes. It does make sense. I see your point completely. So that sense of urgency isn't present. It doesn't exist in the in the is what I'm saying, and this is controversial. It doesn't exist in the in the mind of an addict. Mm-hmm. And 99.9% of the people on this planet are addicts. Wow. They might not be addicted to alcohol, but the addictive system under which we operate, which we call life, and life is just a series of systems, mm-hmm. are all designed to turn you into an addict. Mm-hmm. Just watching TV. I agree. Could turn you into an addict. Listening to this podcast could turn you into an addict. Podcasts are, are addictive. If you listen to the wrong types of them, then, mm-hmm. then that is going to breed the wrong type of behavior, right? Mm-hmm. What if we were listening to a podcast now about two people talking about, you know, how shit the world is and, and, and we should really do something about it by wearing a fucking bomb or taking a gun into school or something. You know, it's like those that we're more exposed to these type of views than ever before. And in yes. a way, in a sense, it's really amazing. It's really wonderful. But but in another sense, it's not. And I think the role of people like me and Vinny is to just help people to start thinking a little bit more about what the fuck is really going on. Exactly, Lee. I, I, I'm glad you said that, Lee, because um, I recognize the... Um, seriousness around this coronavirus but i also recognize these two things that are happening there's everything that's happening on the outside and then there's our inner world Mm. and there's only us inside of there there's no one else there there's only us outside here there's everybody else and whatever's coming in is information we can have our own 
free will on how we deal with that inside of ourselves and how it runs inside of us. So again, I choose to have no fear of the coronavirus. I choose that. But on the outside, I follow all of the protocols. And and to me, that fits in with what you're saying, that we have to wake up and, and, and ask ourselves, is the way that I'm responding to the world or to a given situation, would I choose that if I was fully, would I choose that? Would I say, yes, this is what I want and this serves me and makes me more expansive as a person or am I responding out of fear? Mm. Would I consciously choose to plug in to this box every day and watch hours and hours of fear-based stuff and people suffering? Would I, con- would I consciously choose that from a healthy place? Well, I wouldn't. I would only choose it from a place of fear, I believe. Well, I or, think- or a massive distraction because it means we don't have to think about other things, for example. But mm. it depends on the individual. But I don't believe it comes from a – I think it can come from an intention to be informed so we can better protect ourselves and others. I think there comes a point where we've, we've heard it all and we're just going back over the same information over and over and over again. And then I ask myself, do we really need that information? Do we really need that experience? You would get along fine never watching television ever in your life because the people in your life who do watch it will tell you what is going on. That's what I finally. Yeah. But I mean, here's the thing to what you were saying there. We are all different. So I'm not going to just throw out a, you know, like a, a broad statement here. But I have a feeling in my experience of dealing with addicts that from an an alcohol addiction point of view, one of the reasons that people will be sitting in front of the news and just consuming it is because they don't have that sense of epic meaning and purpose in their life to begin with. So when someone locks you in the house and you don't have a sense of epic meaning and purpose and you might not even be going to work, so now you've got no work, you can't even, you can't even function like your normal zombie robot self, and now you're just at home and you've got no epic meaning, you've got no purpose, you've got no drive, you've lost all hope, you've lost all confidence and courage because alcohol has stripped it away from you, even oh. though we believe, we believe wholeheartedly that it provides us with confidence and courage and joy and happiness. It doesn't eat away all those things, mm-hmm. right? And then all of a sudden we've got nothing to do, so we plug out, we sit down with a bowl of fucking ice cream and we just watch the news. And we just watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it until we don't even know why we're watching it anymore. You know, that I agree. That is, I mean, that's my mum. I that yeah, I'm just I'm just describing my mum to a T there. You know, someone who um, her entire identity was wrapped up in raising children and then raising grandchildren, and now mm-hmm. there are no more children and no more grandchildren to raise. She looks around and thinks, I've got, I've got no meaning, I've got no purpose. And she's lost all confidence and courage to go out and do her own thing. So she's sitting down in front of the TV and smokes and drinks a tea and does the crossroads puzzles and watches that slime come out of the TV. And guess what? Her entire view and belief and worldview around how the world operates all comes from that idiot box <laughs> and it's called cultivation theory and we cover it in the 1000 day sober experience oh, wow. it's it could be devastating to people so what's the alternative though Vinny? so let me give you a, a really might be a complicated one i don't know you might just go boom 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 um but we were talking yesterday weren't we about my father-in-law here in la and um He's 78, he's a tailor, works 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, has done all his life, and now he can't go to work because his shop's shut. So he's, you know, he's getting a bit stir-crazy in the house. He's, and every now and then, he, he's, at the beginning, we were like, come on, you're not going out, you're high risk, we'll go out for you. And then recently, as I've been saying, even though he's sitting in front of the TV, he can't understand it a lot of times because he's Korean and it's English, he started jumping in his car and disappearing. 
And I confronted him the other day and said, look, you need to stop doing this because I'm worried about it and you're putting my family at risk, right? Now, that's his business, right? So when I look at him, we were talking about him leaving the dish on the side on the side of the sink and me getting angry about it. And you said to me, no, that's his business. That's not your business. So in that respect, I can see that. I can just go, oh, that's his business. I don't have to get angry about that. But it's his but it's still his business when he's going out of the house. But that's crossing into my business. So talk about that one a little bit. You got it. It's crossed into your business. Right. Now, if he was going out and there wasn't anything he could catch, well, no, actually, there's plenty out there that we can catch. But this is but different. If, yeah. If it wasn't the coronavirus I'm talking about, yeah, if, if yeah. it wasn't that, then I could make that not my business unless he's putting himself at risk. Then it would become my business because I would care about him. So then I would act upon that. In, in this instance, it is your business because he's putting you and your family at risk. So then I could act upon that. Hmm. Sometimes it's, it's very, very clear. I think in most instances, from my experience, it's very black and white. And there are some gray areas, and that's okay. And there's some that are so complex. It's like, hmm, I have to really reflect on that. But they're very few and far between. Most situations are very clear. It's that person's business and not mine. And I only have to have an improvement of 20% or 25% in terms of me not going into those old patterns of resisting and trying to make the world the way I think it should be. I only need 25% improvement to feel a significant difference. Mm. It's practice, isn't it? It's practice. It's just practice. But what I will say we are all responsible for ourselves, And we all had dreams growing up. We all had dreams. And most people have lost those dreams when they got into a profession. And most people didn't land in the profession they wanted to. And then we have families and children and we carry on doing the work that, and we make the most of it. And then when the kids have gone, that whole identity around a father and a parent just falls away, mm. mostly. And... I think in that moment, there's a choice. Do I want to find out my, my, my life purpose? Do I want to find out, or do I want to find that something that makes me want to get up out of bed in the morning and feel motivated? So for me, it's my change work and, and all this crazy stuff I do around that. It, it's, that seems crazy. That's my life purpose. And that gives me joy. If I didn't have that, I wouldn't be very happy, to be honest, if I didn't have that. So I think, first of all, we've got to believe it's possible and want it. And I, I believe that opens a door inside of us, abilities. And then I would then reflect back on my history and recall the times that my dreams and my goals when I was very young and to see if there was a way of bringing that back into my life. I mean, ultimately, it'd be great to bring that in and then develop it into a business so we can make a living from it. I mean, I get to make a living from waking people up. Mm. How cool is that? Mm. Unbelievable. To free people from the pain and suffering, to wake them up to the divine nature and so forth. Uh, it's just amazing. So, and I do believe that everyone had dreams growing up. They've just, a lot of people have forgotten them. So it takes some work and it takes some consciousness and being present and thinking and reflecting and taking time out of the habitual patterns. What I will say is plug out of that bloody television. You know, if somebody's working, watching soap operas, stop watching them. They're showing you the worst examples of human behavior. You know, if somebody's watching all this corona stuff on telly, plug out of it. You'll get the update. Get the updates on your phone. These apps that will give you an update on your phone, just read them and you've got them. Do you know what you're doing? Mm. Plug out of all that. Watch some comedies, something that's going to bring some joy in your life. And that will then bring you to a crossroads where you have the, the opportunity to take your thinking and your being in a different direction. And then we can start questioning our childhood and, and our goals and dreams and those things that we really wanted to do. You know, it, and it doesn't matter. For some people, it might be knitting. It doesn't matter what it is, but as long as it brings joy, and that that's a fuel that will push us in the right direction. 
So there is no quick answer to this. It's a process and, and a, a journey that we have to step onto and then go down that path. The Using the alcohol, the drugs, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a distraction, is a temporary measure that is nothing more than toxic. Even if it's going to the gym every day, training every day, I guarantee you, in most instances, it's a distraction. Mm. Exercise is fantastic. I love exercise. But anything that's done to an extreme is generally an addiction and a distraction. Um, I think it's called orth orthorexia. <laughs> orthorexia, where you get where you get too you get addicted to health and wellness and all that kind of stuff. Like to, to the extreme where you're you're a breatharian all of a sudden and exactly, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this isn't a criticism, and I'm not criticizing anybody who sits down and watches EastEnders three days a week. If that's what they want to do, get on with it, great. But there's a price to pay, and the price to pay is the mindset we enter into and all of the emotions that we experience as we're watching that. It is drama. I used to watch it 20 years ago. Mm. Oh, it was up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Somebody's getting married. Everyone's singing in the pub and everything, all exciting and everything. Then outside, somebody gets run over. Yeah. Everyone's looking out the pub into the street and the person's led on the floor and then the theme tune comes up. Yeah. Absolutely pure manipulation, pure toxicity and negativity. But if somebody wants to engage in that, good on. You know, if that's what you want to do, that's where they're at. No, awareness is awareness is important, right? So yeah. if I go and watch John Wick 3, what do know what did I watch the other day? Extraction on uh, Netflix, right? So I'm watching Extraction on Netflix. What do I think of it? Plot wise, crap, no plot. Why am I watching it? Um, the fight scenes are really, really great. I get entertained by it. Do I know that it's becoming too violent? Yeah. Is that affecting me a little bit? Yeah, it is a little bit in terms of it's making me cringe a little bit that the scenes are getting too violent. But I'm still entertained, but I'm aware that there's, that there's, a, there's a fine line. So then I, watch, I stop watching Extraction, and then I think to myself, I'm going to spend some time uh, watching Malcolm Gladwell teaching me about how to be a better writer, or I'm going to watch Jerry Seinfeld, and I'm going to have a laugh about it. So... It's being aware that there are forms of entertainment out there and it's good to be entertained, but, but why are you using it? So, so for me, Vinny, until recently, I had, a, I had a rule where I'd only watch one hour of a TV show a day. That was my own time to just kick back, relax, and be entertained, right? Now I don't even have time to do that because I'm choosing to spend that time with my family. Um, but that and going to cinema, going to theatre, you know, entertainment is really important. And I used to watch every, I used to watch Dallas, Dynasty, um, yeah. Neighbours, um, yeah. Home and Away, EastEnders. Yeah. I'm from a north, so Coronation Street. Yeah, oh yes. But, but when I was watching it then, I was watching it with a lethargy. I was watching it with, I've got nothing better to do in my life. And, I'm, and I wasn't even asking myself, and is that okay? Mm, to, ask, right. to ask yourself, is that okay? To even asking yourself, the answer's going to be no, but you're not yes, asking you yourself because you're not, yeah. we're not aware. So, I mean, people listening to this podcast obviously are aware. They wouldn't be listening to this podcast, you know. So and, and yeah. I just want to stress that I know that there are people out there listening to this who are currently in the stuck phase of the 1,000 Day Sober Experience, who are finding it really difficult not to drink and are drinking a lot more because of coronavirus. And you might be listening to what me and Vinny are saying and saying, ah, it's all right for those two to think like that. They have no idea, you know, who I am and how am I experiencing. And I just want to know that, I want you to know that it's very difficult. It's very difficult and very challenging when you're overwhelmed. You become very confused. Um, but here at 1000 Days Sober, if you're part of that program, you are going to get contact from me or the other ambassadors or coaches to say, hey, come on, if you don't wake up a little bit, nothing's going to change. We're not hands off. We don't leave you just wallowing your self-pity and then you come and get us when you're ready. We come to you and say, hey, you know, it, it's difficult to wrap your head around, but 
we do have a choice about what we're thinking about here and how we're going to react to the external situations that are occurring. And we, we have a big say in how our life turns out. And unless you're ready to roll your sleeves up and really face this fear, nothing's going to change, you know? So I agree. And that, that is the, to me, the most significant out of all of this. And that is the moment we make that decision. Mm. And my question is, have I arrived at that place where I've made a decision? So that's what I would be, be asking yeah. myself. Yeah. Have I made that decision? Have I really committed mm. to create a change? And you're more likely to make that decision if you're, a, if you're in a tribe of people who make those decisions on a regular basis. This, well, there's a collective, there's an energy, mm. and it's easy to be swept along with that energy when we're plugged into it, mm. just like... The coronavirus when we're plugged into that or the soaps we get swept along with that collective energy around that as well yeah so it's what what are we plugging into and that's what i ask myself sometimes i find myself doing negative things and i watching negative things on on youtube so i don't watch telly home on youtube yeah the coronavirus for that week or so so on youtube and i and i ask myself really what are you plugging yourself into do you want to be plugged into this Without a shadow of a doubt, it is always no. Mm. When negative and low vibration or low frequency, it's a no I get. But I don't know until I ask myself that question. And it becomes addictively. Mm. I got really into the conspiracy stuff. And um, I think it's good for people to tip the, tip the toe in it and to, to, to see another perspective. However, I really got lost in it. And what I didn't realize until I woke up a little is that I was addicted to the whole chemicals around it, the whole rush, the whole drama around it. Mm. And that's what I was seeking when I was going back on. Mm. I was that, that rush, that adrenaline. And I think um, we've got to be careful what we're plugging into and assess what we are plugged into yeah. and ask ourselves that question. Yeah. We have to be aware of ourselves and aware of the world, but we don't have to be interested in it. We have to recognize the difference between what is our business, what is God's business, and what is the business of other people. Vinny, thanks a lot for joining us today on the podcast. I really appreciate it, and I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, my friend. I've enjoyed myself. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. Now, before you run away, just a few things, okay? So, the next time we run the 1,000 Day Sober Experience, our program that guides you and helps you to become 1,000 Day Sober, so that's 2.7 years, folks, right? It's the only long-term program in the world where we're with you constantly, to help and guide you through the six stages of the Strive Model for Change. We get you through being stuck. We get you through thinking and the ambivalence around drinking alcohol. We get you through the research phase of making some change. We get you through the change. We manage you through that change. And then after that, with alcohol in the rearview mirror, we help you to evolve, to live a fulfilled life, to do that incredibly important post-recovery work which so many people, so many organizations out there dismiss or just don't even cover at all, right? So we got you back for 1,000 days. The next time we run an experience will be in July. But do not wait until then. The best thing that you can do right now is to get over to www.1000daysober.com and sign up to be a member of Strive today. Okay, it is forty pounds a month subscription that includes uh, the one thousand day sober experience. It includes uh, online workshop. It includes online meetings. It includes guidance from our ambassadors. It includes one on one meetings with our incredible Strive coaches who are uh, skilled at a vast array of important elements of your life that are going to drive up and increase your physical and mental health. And by joining now, you get used to the environment, you get used to the community, you get used to the people. And when by the time July comes along, you'll be firing on all cylinders, kind of roaring to get into the 1000 Days Sober Experience. So do that today. Really, really important. If you want to get the show notes 
for today. The show notes are exceptional, folks. You get the show notes from today's episode. You want to get a full transcription of today's episode. And you want to get a special workbook um, that will give you some, some fun and interesting questions based on today's episode that you can help that will um, one-up your life, right? Then get over to www. 1000daysober.com. You will find the link there and sign up, give us your email address, and we will give you uh, we will give you these things free of charge, okay? And on that 40 pounds a month, if you do not have the money, if you are struggling financially, then email me at the truth by alcohol at gmail.com and we'll figure something out. Do not let money get in your way of becoming 1000 days sober. And just because we go 1000 days sober, right? Don't be worried about that if you're not quite ready to quit yet. The first stage of the strive model for change is called stuck. The second stage is called thought. And we do not expect you to stop drinking whilst you're doing that work. And that will take you a good four to five months. So you get a lot of grace. We will meet you where you're at in your addiction to alcohol. Don't worry about that, okay? We take on everybody. People who are desperately trying to stop drinking and people who are stopped drinking and they just want help putting their life back together, okay? Um, Lastly, if you enjoyed listening to our Condition Podcast, then please rate and review it on your local provider, whether that would be Apple or SoundCloud or whatever. Uh, just give us a nice review and some nice stars. You can find us on Instagram at 1000daysober.com or 1000daysober. And you can find us on YouTube, 1000daysober as well. All right, take care of yourselves, folks. Ciao, ciao.